Okay. So, I'm a bloke from Wigan, a place called Ints, to be particular. Um, I accidentally um, got a degree in psychology after leaving school with two GCSEs. Well, O levels they were before GCSEs. Uh, woodwork and religious studies. And my dad said to me, the only person who ever made that work was Jesus' dad. <laughs> so it is a complete accident that I'm here at all, frankly. Um, how did I get here? Obviously by train, because we're at the train station. That was a no-brainer. Um, and it's not an existential question. I just thought you should probably know a bit about why I think I can stand here and talk about this. Um, first thing is, I accidentally got this interest in psychology. And then my first job um, after leaving university was at Presswich Hospital. Um, that one at the top. Have I got a pointer? That's too, no, let's just not risk it. We set fire to the place with the laser beam. Um, that one at the top on the right hand side, I started working at Presswich Hospital, and that was my first job after university. I was working on the, what they called affectionately the old long stay awards. Um, oh God, right, okay. <laughs> Wish money pay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that's your like, Kevin. James Bond thing. No, never mind. That will explode in about 30 seconds, of course. Um, so I started working at Presswich Hospital, and it was a shock to the system because this, these old long stay awards were basically a place where they put people 30 or 40 years ago because they were experiencing stress or they had something bad happen to them. And then I'd turn up, and you know, 40 years later, and those people are still there, not getting better. No one's talking about them recovering. No one's talking about them leaving. And the, I looked through the records trying to make sense of this as you know, a newly uh, kind of out of university person who wanted to help but didn't really know a lot about the world. And um, the only thing I could see they had in common really was that they had particularly stressful life events or trauma in their life. Um, but nobody was talking about that. Nobody addressed it. It wasn't part of the discussion. So that, that all for me seemed, that just seemed wrong. And, the whole thing was a really good example of institutionalisation, though we kind of marginalise and separate people from the rest of society and expect that to solve the problem. We're still doing it with prisons, of course, but that was my uh, experience. This photograph of the young man, uh, that was me uh, 25 years ago. That's a before and after photograph. It's kind of a warning to any young people who may be in the audience. Um, and then I went on to sort of, uh, well, I kind of decided that developing more and better treatments and interventions for people with psychosis based on the fact that most of them experience trauma, would be a very good thing to do. So I spent the next however many years, over a decade, squirrelling away, working on cognitive approaches for people with psychosis. At a time when that wasn't something that was recommended. In fact, it was people advised against it. And that book was published in 2006. Um, very controversial at the time. Um, my first consultant job, my boss took me into his office I probably shouldn't say this on camera, but he was the medical director, and uh, gave me a polite telling off on my first day, because I was, he didn't want me causing trouble with these ideas about bad things happening to people, causing serious mental health problems. No, we don't have any of that here. Don't you go causing trouble. So, yeah, I got told off before I started, which was uh, interesting. Whereas today, I think you'll find that it's not actually that controversial, is it? So it just goes to show how far things have come in 10, 13 years. Um, and then, I got a job as clinical director for children and family services in Lancashire in the NHS and my perspective shifted. I realised that more and better therapies was probably not what we needed. Probably what we needed was to focus on prevention, to stop it happening in the first place. We can't meet demand. People can't access the therapies they've already got. So what we needed was to, to shift. And my perspective then was all about leadership, policy development, system change and that's, that's kind of what I've done since. So that's it, that's me. Um, this study came out in 1998, around the time that I had that photograph taken and I was at Presswich Hospital. Um, kind of mind-blowing, paradigm shift, kind of landmark study, which was promptly ignored for the next two decades. Um, so we find out from a public health perspective that particular life events predictably and reliably lead to poor outcomes for people poor physical health, poor mental health, and poor social outcomes in a dose response fashion. And then we do nothing with it, which is remarkable, really. Although when you look at the fact we knew smoking killed people 50 years before we banned it in public, I guess it's not that remarkable, but 
20 years is a long time to ignore what is probably one of the most important public health discoveries of our generation. You all know about this, so I won't tell you much other than Vincent Fleety discovered through his pioneering work on uh, obesity that actually people coming back to his clinic who'd lost lots of weight and transformed the health status. When they put the weight back on and he was baffled by that, he discovered that actually what he, wasn't, what he, was, he thought he was dealing with was a biomedical problem. And what he, what he actually discovered was that he was dealing with a psychosocial problem, that people were eating and using food as a self-soothing mechanism, as a psychoactive substance. It was making them feel better. And when they went back to their lives in the community, they just went back to their coping strategy to feel better. The second thing he found out was that most of his patients experienced abuse or serious household dysfunction and struggled to self-regulate and had trauma related to that. And the third thing that he realised is that people felt safer when they were big. So some of the gentlemen in his clinic said they felt less likely to be assaulted and bullied if they were formidable in size. And some of the women said they felt less likely to be sexually assaulted if they were obese. So he, he, he had a kind of complete epiphany moment, a Damascene moment, and he realised that, well, if this is happening in all of these people I'm working with, and it seems really common, maybe we need to survey the rest of the people who are in the Kaiser Permanente Health Programme. And what they found was pretty startling. They found a dose-response relationship. They found that people with more adversity had worse outcomes. And they found that in almost 10,000 Californians. By the way, these were middle-class Americans who could afford private health insurance. Not, it wasn't an area of poverty, deprivation. These are pretty well-off people. Yet they were having extremely high rates of abuse, neglect, alcoholism, you know, drug problems, violence at home, sexual abuse, physical abuse, etc. You know the list of ten that you know most about. So that was a shock. Um, and then the other thing that, that kind of strikes me, we find the same things 20 years later. There have been lots of global studies, household surveys. We find the same things across cultures, across countries, across social strata. We see the same patterns. And every study that looks for a dose-response relationship finds it. So this is not an accident. Um, the other thing that strikes me is that we're still not asking about it routinely. We still not talk to people about what happened in their lives. We still don't talk to people about adversity, candidly and openly and honestly. In most services where people seek help, which just strikes me as bizarre, because when you look at the evidence, most people don't mind being asked if it's done respectfully and, and kindly and compassionately. In fact, people appreciate it. But it still doesn't happen in our services. The other thing that we know now, and, and actually we, we kind of discovered 20 years ago, is that people are sick more often if they're exposed to toxic stress. The term toxic stress was coined by the Harvard Center on the Developing Child, and it basically means chronic stress in the absence of any buffering factors, any mitigating factors, like a safe, stable adult relationship or a caregiver that's responsive. But people get sick more often. They have more mental health problems. They get more cancer, more heart disease become the victim of violence and the perpetrator of violence more often, go to prison more often. So there's a massive human cost associated with this, but there's also a, a huge financial cost associated with it as well. Um, people who have more adversity as a population seem to have more time off work, use more health resources, have more mental health issues, have more emergency service contact, and have more criminal justice involvement. So I think by any definition of what's, what's kind of reasonable, we can agree that this is possibly the biggest opportunity we've got to transform the health and well-being of our population. Probably the single biggest opportunity that remains unexploited. The findings that came about from that original study were pretty mind-blowing. And I remember emailing Vincent Fleety after I'd read it, and he said, we checked the figures lots of times. We checked the figures again and again, and we didn't quite believe them because they were seeing magnitudes of increased risk and odds that, that you don't normally see in epidemiology. So for example, they found in the original study, people with four races were seven times more likely to self-report as being addicted to alcohol, which is probably an under-report. And people were 12 times more likely at that population level to have attempted suicide. So these are quite startling findings. And then 20 years later, we find from the Bellis and colleagues study in 2014-15, but actually, we still see that pattern where adversity leads to health, harm, and behaviours and poor outcomes for people. 
So people with four ACEs compared to people with none are six times more likely to have had or caused an unplanned teenage pregnancy. Seven times more likely to have been the victim or perpetrator of violence than last year. And 11 times more likely to have used crack or heroin or have gone to jail. And yet it's still not at the forefront of public and social policy. In Scotland, you're doing incredibly well, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But in England, no one seems to even have an opinion about this. You don't hear any politicians talking about it. Disappointing. And embarrassing, frankly, if you're watching. Um, a couple of things I think is important. I know Bruce Perry's going to talk about this far more eloquently and you know, engagingly than I, I probably ever could, but two bits of the kind of physiology and, and neuroscience seem important to mention. First one is this idea of toxic stress affecting the way the brain develops. Um, two things stand out for me. One is attachment. And if, if a, an infant's not had a solid attachment with a, with a reliable caregiver, that affects the, the way they feel about themselves, the world, their sense of safety, their sense of connection, their ability to self-regulate. And then attunement. So if an attuned caregiver isn't responsive to that infant's needs, they don't learn, they don't have the opportunity for co-regulation. And then in turn, they don't learn self-regulation. And when synaptic pruning happens and the brain becomes leaner and more efficient in those first thousand days of life, that opportunity to hardwire that, that ability to downregulate the nervous system is lost to some extent, which means you're going to have to learn it later on in life. But growing up without the ability to self-regulate or self-manage, to deal with your stress response, makes life hard. I'm not doing anything. I don't know why this is happening. Can anybody else see the feedback? It's all right if you're in a rock band. It's not so good if you stood here. Anyway, hello, Wembley. <laughs> I feel like Freddie Mercury before he played uh, Live Aid. Not because I'm talking to a huge room, but because I didn't sleep the night before. He was probably up all night party and I just didn't sleep because of the trucks and the bands. Um, yeah, so there's this thing about self-regulation, the ability to downregulate your nervous system. Um, we know now that if people haven't learned that, if they haven't embedded that in infancy, you get trouble later on managing your emotions, managing relationships, dealing with anger, dealing with stress, being able to stay calm, and as a consequence, is it a surprise that people seem more prone to addictions later on? Because you need to find a way of settling yourself, don't you? You need to find a way, a way of feeling calm. And then if you experience all the trauma along the way, if you're in pain, you're in emotional distress, you've got to find a way of suppressing that as well. So it leaves people vulnerable later on in life. The next thing is allostatic load, the wear and tear, the premature wear and tear on the immune system. Psychoneuroimmunology is a branch of science. It's really well established, um, not particularly controversial. And there are years of research that show us the stress response is this super system that affects every molecule in the body and too much exposure to stress hormones, too frequent activation of the stress response, the fight or flight mechanism, puts undue stress on the heart, on the cardiovascular system more generally, leads to imbalances of hormones, makes you vulnerable to certain kinds of cancer. You have too many immune, um, sorry, inflammatory cells going around your body because of that fight or flight mechanism. And consequently, it leads to illness. It's like having, I think it's like having a Formula One car revved into the red all the time. You've got this really amazing machine, but if it's put under such pressure, it'll break down eventually. As a shelf life, it'll stop working. So people get sick more often. A recent study from Public Health Wales of two and a half thousand people showed us that that was true. They found that people with four races compared with people who had none um, use more healthcare resources. They, they saw the GP twice as often in the last year. They went to a and &E three times more often and spent three times more, um, more time in hospital. They were also more likely, four times more likely to develop diabetes type 2, which is obviously predominantly driven by lifestyle. Three times more likely to develop a heart disease and three times more likely to develop respiratory conditions, which apart from if you live in a particularly um, difficult environment where that's contributing are usually inflammatory in nature. The other thing we talked about was addictions and I think this quote by Daniel Sumrock is fantastic. So he works in Tennessee. Uh, there's a great article on Ace Connections if you want to read it. But I met someone the other day who knows him and he's doing great work in his addiction clinic. 
But what he said was, the solution to changing illegal or unhealthy ritualized compulsive comfort seeking behavior of opioid addiction is to address a person's adverse childhood experiences, either individually or in group, give them the right medication to help them withdraw from opiates safely, and to help them find ritualized compulsive comfort seeking behavior that won't kill them or put them in jail. So in summary, it's no good just asking people to stop doing something that's making them feel better. It, what we have to do is give them a safer and better coping strategy. We have to give them something else. In fact, asking someone to stop using their best coping strategy, their only coping strategy, is probably unethical unless we give them something better and safer. Hence, the success rate of services helping people withdraw from heroin is about 10%. It's a class leading outcome. So we have to find other ways, and, and addiction services do an amazing job. And I've spent last year working with addiction services. I know they do amazing things, but they don't have enough therapeutic resource commissioned as part of the services in, my, in the limited experience that I've got. I, th I think they need, to be, they need to be more integrated. They need more access to psychological support and social support to help people rebuild their lives and find better and safer ways of coping, but also to deal with the pain. You know, Gabo Mate said, it's not, the, the wrong question is why the addiction, the right question is why the pain. So we, so we have to address that in the first place, otherwise, like people with obesity, we give them bariatric surgery, seen as a medical success because they lose lots of weight, but you look at the other body literature which says people who've had bariatric surgery, compared to the general population, have more addictions and more attempts at suicide. So we can't just take away a coping strategy without offering somebody something better and safer. I have no idea what that says because it's too high up. Okay. So I would, I would broaden this perspective and say, actually, all of the things that are causing problems in our society, a lot of the problems we deal with on a day-to-day, -day, what we could collectively call addictions. Drugs, food, gambling, sex, violence. All ways of coping, all ways of feeling better, all ways of trying to self-soothe, trying to feel in control, trying to block out the pain. They provide short-term relief, but they don't last. You keep having to do it and it affects your health, it affects your well-being, it affects your relationships, your family, your community, and it continues and that cycle carries on. So treating the symptoms of someone's attempts to cope with the pain they're in because of adversity or trauma isn't effective. Treat, treating the attempts to cope doesn't make any sense, does it? What we've got to do is acknowledge that that's someone's attempt to cope and find out whether it's working for them or not. And if it's not, help them find a safer and better alternative. Part of that is helping people see that what they've been through is probably contributing to why they're in pain. And what they've been through is probably, how they're coping probably makes sense in the context of what they've been through. Now that might sound obvious, but it's not happening in a lot of services. It doesn't happen in mental health services most of the time. If you go to mental health services, they won't necessarily ask you whether you've experienced adversity or trauma. They'll ask you what your symptoms are. They'll try and diagnose you. And once you've got a label, a diagnosis, they go, oh, we know what the treatment is. <coughs> he's got personality disorder, or he's got psychosis, or he's got dissociative identity disorder, whatever. So we know what's wrong with him, so we know what the treatment is. What they don't do is ask what happened to you, and how it made you feel, and whether it still bothers you, and if you want any help with it. That's a huge problem. So if we help people link the past to their current pain and the way they're coping, you can at least make an informed choice. You can at least see that there's some sense in this. And you can also be a bit more self-compassionate. You can say, okay, it makes sense actually, given what I've been through, that I'm coping in this way. It makes sense that I'm in pain. Anybody will be. It's not just that I'm crap or I'm not very good at relationships or that I struggle with willpower or boundaries. It's not that, it's the fact that Anybody would struggle if they'd been through what I've been through. So that's a wonderful realisation, and you can move on from that. So the life course picture is really predictable. It's pretty depressing on one hand. People have adversity, it affects their health, their brain development, their ability to manage relationships, they struggle to learn at school because they don't feel safe. They adopt health harming behaviors that make them feel better in the short term and damages the health in the long term and they tend to die 20 years sooner if they've had six more ounces. So it's a pretty depressing story. But from a public health perspective, it's a great news story because it's very predictable. And if it's predictable, it's preventable. We can do something about it. It's not a mystery. None of this is a mystery to us. 
Mark Bell has calculated in 2015 that if we were able to reduce the impact of adversity on the next generation, we could see a reduction in unintended teenage pregnancies by about 40%. We could see heroin and crack use reduced by almost 60%. We could see half as many people going to prison. We could see half as many people being a victim of violence or a perpetrator of violence. There are some huge prizes available. But it requires system change. Karen was saying, you know, we've got to mobilise ourselves, we've got to organise ourselves and be a kind of unstoppable force. We've got to see the long term, the bigger picture. We can't say, oh, well, yes, we'll, we'll wait for the government to give us permission or we'll wait for the government to give us some funding. Or We've got to see beyond that. You know, looking at a four-year cycle or five-year cycle is completely futile. We've got to see, irrespective of who's in power, what the political whims are, what the funding situation is, we've got to see the goal and maybe point ourselves 20, 30 years into the future and say, you know what, we could see things completely changing for the next generation. That's doable. I think that's doable. I think that should be motivating for people coming into health and caring jobs. You know, you call it, if I was, that was me qualifying, you know, 20 odd years ago, someone said to me, within a generation, we can transform health and well-being for our population. Wow, what an amazing opportunity that would be. Financially, if that hasn't motivated you already to think we can do something about it, um, recent study in the Lancet Public Health Journal showed that in Europe, I'm sorry it's been cut off for some reason, but in Europe, um, a 10% reduction in adverse childhood experiences would equate to an annual saving of $49 billion. Even if we manage to reduce harmful alcohol use, 25% of which is attributed to adverse childhood experiences in this study, that would reduce costs by 143 billion. So economically, it's a no-brainer. You know, this is an investor-save strategy. We spend a minute amount of our resources on prevention. We spend most of it on picking up the pieces. We've got to shift that balance. We've got to shift that perspective. In Scotland, oh, sorry, I've got to say that this. The bigger picture is, those adversities that we know and talk about a lot, they're kind of fairly familiar to us now, but actually we have to acknowledge that the conditions, the social conditions that underlie them, make them more likely. So children who live in poverty are three times more likely to be sexually abused, and children who live in poverty are seven times more likely to be neglected. It's not a surprise that if you have a mental health problem, you're living in a violent relationship, you live in an area with lots of crime, you haven't got safe housing, you've got no social support, you're stressed, you don't sleep, you've got nobody you can rely on. Is it a surprise that you're not 100% available to your kids? Is it a surprise that you struggle to parent, that you struggle to get through the day, that maybe you drink too much in the evening, that you develop a drug problem, that you kind of struggle to know what to do with your kids? Is it a surprise? So we have to, we have to tackle the social conditions that make this more likely as well. And in Scotland, you're doing, you know, you've got a great, um, you have a position to build on. I think you've got government support, you've got commitments in, the, in this kind of plan for government, you've got promises in the, the document about legislative priorities. And all of these things really help, don't they? They acknowledge that this is one of the biggest opportunities we've got. So I think, I always talk about what's happening in Scotland because I, I kind of think you, you've probably got it right, you know. Um, five million people, I agree. Most of them are in this room today, if I look to it. Um, I think you're going to show the rest of Europe how to do it. I think this is going to be an amazing decade. And I do think it's possible. I think within a generation we could see some massive changes. So you're on, a, you're on the front foot. Uh, you've got the trauma training framework and the the kind of training schedules that go with it, which is, again, a great place to start. Train the workforce, give them the skills, the knowledge, the right attitudes, the permission to work with trauma and adversity. Brilliant. I want to acknowledge some controversies, because the, you, if you spend time on Twitter and you manage to retain any sense of balance and reality, uh, you will realise that there are a lot of controversies out there. Number one, population research findings should not be applied to individuals. Yeah, I agree. Um, because someone says, you know, because the research says if you have six ASs, you'll die 20 years sooner. It means nothing on an individual level, does it? It means nothing. So my point is, why are you, why are you scoring an ACE questionnaire? It's all about an individual formulation. 
what are someone's resources, what are someone's coping strategies, how does that offset what they've been through, do they want help, do they need help? So it's all about individual understanding. A scores can be unhelpful, agreed. Why are you scoring a nurse questionnaire is my question. Are you an epidemiologist? If not, step away from the calculator, you don't need it. A, an ACE questionnaire is a prop, it's a, a tool to facilitate a therapeutic conversation. That's it. It's helpful because people don't have to say the words, and it's helpful because people know what you're asking them, and it's helpful because people, it's consistent every time. And you get higher disclosure rates of the questionnaire than you do if you use a verbal technique. So it's useful. Causality is not established. Well, causality is not established in most areas of science, actually. Uh, it's incredibly complicated. No one agrees exactly what the test of causality is. And you could, you could lose days, weeks, months, years of your life trying to prove causality. In some areas, like psychosis, child abuse and psychosis, we think we've proved a causal link. But for the rest of us, the evidence is so compelling. I don't think we need to worry too much about the exact mechanisms at this stage. I think we just need to get on and do some you know, do some stuff to make things improve for people who've been through adversity and who are suffering. Um, instead of arguing about whether it's causal or not. And the other thing that comes up a lot, well, ACEs is this biological determinism. You know, it's not very optimistic. Well, you know, decades of science document this stress disease connection. So it's not that controversial, actually. And I think what we have to remember is that social competence and resilience can be built at any point in the life course. But you can only really start having a meaningful conversation with somebody about resilience and social competence and those kinds of things when they acknowledge and understand that what's happened to them is affecting how they're living. So it's really important that we see this as an opportunity for improvement, improving people's lives rather than a deficit focus. I certainly see it as a biopsychosocial issue, not as a biological determinism issue. Um, some people say the ACE solution equals preventative behaviour change or therapy to fix the past. Um, and it ignores the social determinants of poverty. I don't agree. I don't think we can fix the past. What we can do is help people live better lives, help people live lives that they're happier with. Um, we can't fix the past. It's not about preventing people and trying to you know, correct behaviour. It's about helping people understand that, you know what, if we create a better and more equal society with less poverty and we focus on families and we help them, we might have a better outcome for the next generation. Fixing behaviours and, and trying to tackle symptoms is too little too late, in my opinion. And then there's another comment. Um, Ace of Word means, this is like my greatest hits on Twitter, really, this. Um, Ace of Word means identifying and monitoring families and children deemed at risk due to a high Ace score, monitoring them. So I heard about one social care team that used an Ace score as a way of determining who they were going to monitor, which is pretty, it's a little bit, yeah, a little bit dark and it? it's a bit murky, quite deficit focused. Um, you could see it becoming a, you know, a sinister sort of a trajectory. But the vast majority of the time, it's not used in that way. The vast majority of the time, this, this concept of ace aware, for me, means increasing knowledge and recognition that actual adversity is common at all levels of society. It's rarely discussed. It affects well-being. It can sometimes be prevented, often mitigated, and frequently overcome. That's what it means to me and that societal, cultural and system change are necessary to shift this whole picture. That's what I think ACE word means. So there's some controversies. I'm sure there are lots more. Uh, if you want to tweak them, don't bother, because I ain't reading them. Um, <laughs> what is trauma-informed care? This is important. Uh, we hear a lot about it. But it's not a new concept. It's been around for quite a long time. And put simply, it means using this science that we've talked about to, to inform the way you design services and systems. Which kind of makes sense given that most people we work with will have experienced trauma adversity. In fact, probably most of us in the room have experienced it. Far from being biological determinism, it is truly biopsychosocial. When we look at it, Ultimately, it means, you know, if we're going to have, if we're going to develop services and offers for people, well, let, let's do it with them, let's co-create with them, let's co-produce, let's see what people want as well as what we think they need. Um, let's look at how we deliver at the point of care. Let's see if we can 
infuse that with some science and some insight about how we do it and make it safer and easier for people, not re-traumatise people. Let's look at whether people feel safe, staff and service users. Let's look at how we train our workforce and also look after our workforce because for me supervision is sadly lacking in lots and lots of professions and workplaces. We don't look after staff, we don't look after the people that look after the people. We expect them to turn up day after day and deal with very emotive and difficult things without giving them enough care and support and helping them deal with their issues. We somehow think once we get into a caring role, we, we're kind of immune to it. Um, let's measure the right things as well. You know, Systems and processes might sound a bit boring, but they're important because they determine what we do, how we do it, and what opportunities we have. But it also determines what we measure. And currently we seem to measure, certainly in healthcare, we measure how many, what our caseload is, what our throughput is, whether people turn up or not. What we don't measure is the quality of the relationship, the therapeutic alliance, the depth of engagement, the trust. You can measure that stuff. You can measure that stuff. It's important that we start trying to measure it. And how we hire people, and that word's American, I think, onboarding, I think, is an American term. I don't think it means if you've fallen off a boat, you bring them back on board. I don't think it means that. Maybe. Um, so we must pull our staff back out of the water if they fall into the water and bring them back on board, apparently. Um, and then, finally, if it's not an organisational commitment, it's not going to happen, basically. So you know, that's generally a good place to start. And you can, from that, develop practice standards for organisations. So, I'll talk to you, to you now briefly about one of my favourite subjects, which is routine or targeted adversity inquiry. Um, if you remember anything from today, from my talk anyway, waiting to be told doesn't work. Just let that land for a second. Okay, we can carry on. Waiting to be told doesn't work. Um, people don't want to volunteer their deepest, most personal, sometimes most fearful and shameful experiences. They don't want to volunteer that when, they see, when they're involved in services, unless they're asked. People need permission to share with you. And people need to feel safe and know they've got an ongoing relationship and know that you can actually be there for them if, you, if they choose to disclose. And they need to know who gets to know about it and what happens next. But waiting to be told does not work. We can't assume that people will tell us. When you look at survivors of abuse, in mental health services, they, they tend to wait between 9 and 16 years before disclosing in services. All the while, they're probably getting medication that isn't helping. They're probably getting treatments and labels and diagnosis that are not helping. They're not dealing with the root issues. They're dealing with the surface symptoms. In uh, Auckland, New Zealand, John Reed and Alan Fraser changed the policy in their psychiatric hospital to include a questionnaire about adversity, particularly physical and sexual abuse. They observed the next 100 admissions the next 100 admission assessments, 8% of the people revealed physical or sexual abuse at any point in their life, voluntarily. They then asked the next 100 people, as part of their assessment, whether they'd experienced physical or sexual abuse at any point in their life. 82% of the people said, yes, thank you for asking. So if we don't ask people, they don't tell us. If we ask and it makes sense to them, they will share with us. And finally, commissioners worry about this huge tidal wave of demand. You know, if we start asking people these questions, maybe, that, maybe we'll ask, you know, they'll all want CBT or they'll all want EMDR or some sort of counselling, and we can't, we have, you know, we just can't do it, we can't afford it. Well, actually the evidence so far doesn't add up to that argument. What we find is that in this particular study, in 135,000 people, which is a two year intake of the Kaiser Health Plan, they found that in the year following being given the opportunity to talk about adversity, but that 135,000 people used 35% less visits to their GP and 11% less visits to A&E because they were given the chance to talk about their experiences with someone they trusted. And Vincent Leeds just published a paper that explains why that might be. Um, and it goes as follows. <coughs> Slowly we came to see that asking, initially by an inert mechanism, which was the questionnaire, and then followed up face to face in the exam room with either a doctor or a nurse, coupled with listening and implicitly accepting that individual who has just shared his or her dark secrets is a powerful form of doing. That is the intervention, that is the therapeutic moment. 
telling somebody your most fearful and, and worst life experiences and being believed, and someone saying, thank you for sharing that with me, I believe you, that was really brave. You must be really resilient, you must be really strong. Um, and, and do you think that still affects you in some way? Is that something that bothers you? And if so, is that something we can help you with? We don't have to talk about it now, but we can come back to it if you want to. But thank you for sharing it. That seems to make a massive difference. We also know from the last two decades of research on therapeutic disclosure that unburdening is healthy. Keeping big secrets, keeping painful secrets and memories suppressed is unhealthy. It affects our immune system, it affects our cardiovascular system, it affects our mental health adversely. When you disclose in a safe way, when you unburden in a safe way, it leads to multiple health benefits. James Pennybacker found this out 20 odd years ago by accident. <clears throat> and in a group of people who wrote about their worst life experiences, 50 minutes, four days in a row, when followed up, that group of people had better cardiovascular health, used the GP less in the next year, had better mental health, and had less cortisol and adrenaline in their bodies. They took cerebrospinal fluid in this study, believe it or not. Glad I didn't volunteer for that one. But this book is wonderful and, again, an underutilised opportunity. For me, writing and expressing in writing is a fairly safe and benign opportunity if it's managed well and done with planning and kind of informed consent. Um, unburdening in a safe way is healthy. <clears throat> the programme that I developed called Routine Inquiry about Adversity in Childhood has been going now for, God, years. Um, here are some selected studies. What we find is that before the training, most people don't know much about it. Most professionals don't know much about adversity and certainly don't ask people routinely what happens to them. What we also find is that when you do start to ask people in a whole range of different service settings is they tend to tell you what's happened to them and then you can make a better care plan and a better response and tailor it to their needs. Deal with the underlying pain, not just the symptoms. And also, the other thing that I think is really good about this is that it tends to, from what we've found so far, it tends to improve therapeutic alliance. And the therapeutic alliance, the quality of relationship, is the strongest predictor of change in any psychosocial or psychotherapeutic endeavour, which is wonderful. <clears throat> the, other, the other great bit is that when you ask parents, and in this case, family support team in Blackburn, we work with parents who really weren't that keen on engaging with social care services. Ask them about their own adversity, and very quickly the parents reflect on their own experiences. And they go, oh my God, I had no idea. I'm just doing what my parents did. I'm just repeating what my parents did. And I want, actually, I want better for my kids. I had no idea that that was affecting them. <clears throat> Can I have some help? Oh my God, so then you've got a window to offer support, social and emotional support, parenting programs. Rahane Ali, one of the support workers, said, it's not suddenly changed 30 odd years of behaviour and it hasn't undone all those experiences, but it has made them question, oh, what are my children going through? What aces am I putting in front of my children? And I think it started a journey for them. And that's the best we can hope for. We can't fix someone's life, but we can start a journey for them. We can start on an optimistic, forward-thinking perspective once people understand and start to join the dots. We also did uh, routine inquiry work in GPs in Lancashire in three practices. Uh, and I haven't got time to tell you much about it other than it was highly acceptable to patients and staff. Um, people appreciated being asked. Even the people who did want to take part in the inquiry said they appreciated being asked. There was very high rates of approval and people felt that it improved their appointment. The vast majority of people felt it improved their appointment. And a significant proportion of people in the following three months used less medication and less GP appointments after having the opportunity to talk about their adversity. We're currently doing a similar Pathfinder piece of work in um, Scotland with some of the deep end practices. And it's very early days. What's amazing is that they're prepared to try it at all, given the pressure they're under. Um, and there's an independent, independent study going to happen. So it's very much a naturalistic study, see what works, what's possible in GP practices in Scotland in the deep end. Um, and what can we learn from it? So it's great that that's happening. Uh, Peter Cairns, one of the GPs, said, I asked him for a quote, and he said, well, we're so busy, and under such pressure, it'd be easy for us to opt out of this, of this, of exploring this inquiry. But we have experienced how, when used sensitively, it can trans transform difficult relationships. Our experience echoes the research finding elsewhere, which is not always the case when implementing practice change in the real world, which is nice. 
Uh, and I also think ACE Inquiry ties in with the wider necessary reorientation of primary care around the needs of local communities. So I thought that was very encouraging, given the, you know, the pressure and the circumstances that some of these GPs are working in. So thanks to Peter for that. Um, looking at my time, I, I have not got time to talk much about this, but if you want to look at the Early Intervention Foundation website for their repository of evidence, you want to look at the Public Health Wales report recently on what works in tackling adversity, please do. Both excellent resources. Um, they'll tell you the same things, right? They'll tell you that we can prevent childhood adversity. If we invest in parenting and support child and family wellbeing, you'll get a massive return on investment and we can prevent childhood adversity. If we need early intervention and detection because we can effectively mitigate the impact of adversity. And finally, we can promote resilience because resilience is the antidote to ACEs. It offsets adversity. People can have 10 ACEs, people have as many ACEs as you want, but if they've got enough adversity and resources, it'll offset it. I'll give you one example before I come to a conclusion. I've got, you can look at the slides afterwards, there's, there's quite a lot in there about the evidence, but Triple P is one form of parenting intervention. Normally these interventions are targeted. But when they made it universally available in, in this example, it was South Carolina, they've done it in Queensland and in Ireland uh, as well. They found that in the second year after they'd implemented universal access to parenting, everybody's got a kid gets access to parenting interventions, online, in a group, one-to-one, -one, loads of different versions of it. Made it less stigmatised, made it just seem kind of regular and normal. What they noticed was in the following, in the second year when they, when they kind of um, evaluated is that they saw almost a quarter less child maltreatment cases <clears throat> in that state where they implemented universal access to parenting. So they were preventing child maltreatment. They also saved $9 for every dollar they spent on providing those parenting interventions. I think it's pretty powerful. Investing in the early years, investing in parents, helping families, it's, it's a bit of a no-brainer. Return on investment is huge. Targeted family support, prevention focused initiatives, all those things are really effective, but we've got to make sure staff are trained to deliver them and they're done with fidelity. <coughs> These other programmes, equally amazing, Operation Encompass is fantastic, helping kids, supporting kids the day after there's been a domestic, a domestic abuse incident in, in the home, the police contact the school, school responds and supports the child. Amazing, buffering the impact of toxic stress. There's loads of evidence-based interventions for specific traumas and adversities, but the key is making them accessible. That's the thing. It's all right saying we've got these things, but making them available to your average person is the challenge. That's what we need to work on. And this study, recently this study was published and it was great because it said positive childhood experiences have a dose-response relationship with positive mental health later on. So we know adverse childhood experiences lead to poor outcomes. We also know that positive childhood experiences have a dose additive effect. The more of these things you experience in childhood, the more protected you are against poor mental health and more likely are to have positive relational health later on in life. It says the same thing as the Public Health Well study, which says if you've got a trusted adult relationship in childhood and you've experienced ACEs, if, you've had, if you feel connected, you feel like you belong, you've got supportive relationships, you'll be less prone to mental health issues later on. So resilience is something that's available. Most of it, I would say, is social in nature. It's not technology, it's not expensive therapies, it's not expensive drugs or scans or whatever. It's social, it's relational. We, we need to connect people with those opportunities. Mentoring programmes are an amazing opportunity as well, which are underutilised. I haven't got time to talk about, but I could, given the opportunity. Schools, oh my god, I haven't got time, but in this study by Richard Layard, a life course study, the worst predict predictor of adult life satisfaction at age 34 was educational attainment at school. The best predictor was emotional health while at school. So focusing on test results, mm -hmm, not so sure about that. Focusing on emotional health for kids who might not have a safe adult at home, having a safe adult at school got to be a priority, hasn't it? We've got a, we've got a harness system change. I know I've only got 30 seconds left. Um, I do a lot of workshops on system change, these are the components, I haven't got time to talk to you about it, but if we tackle all these different elements across a system, across a partnership, 
And we have collective goals and commitments and a shared vision, and it's longer than a few years, but it's a long-term thing. We could see change for the next generation. Absolutely. And finally, what we know from ancient wisdom and modern science is the same thing, which is reassuring, isn't it? We over rely on diagnosis and treatment and technology, but we've known forever that the thing that makes a difference is relationships, the quality of the relationship. We know that in, in childhood, the quality of the parental relationship predicts so well the child will develop and do later on in life. We know if it's a teacher, we know the quality of the relationship will buffer the impact of stress and how the child develop. We know if you're in a caring role, it's the relationship that heals. It's the relationship that heals. It's the relationship that heals. Irving Elon said that, so it must be true. So I'll finish on that note and say that actually everything we do, everything we've talked about, and the rest of the stuff we're going to talk about today is all fantastic, and there's lots of things we can do. But this has got to remain central to everything, unless we have sincere, authentic connections with people, unless we have the opportunity and permission to connect, and we start valuing that, we're going to leave a lot on the table. We're going to miss out on all the opportunities we have to transform people's lives. So I'll leave you on that thought. It is the relationship heals. Thank you.